All right, okay, so we're on to our, our, our second research conversation. Uh, Judith uh, Oshvishlanger studied Hebrew and Semitic and ancient Near Eastern languages in Paris, and then got her PhD at Cambridge in 1995, after which she came here and was a, a junior research fellow at Somerville, 95-98, uh, before disappearing back to Paris, uh, where she's been... Uh, first at the CNRS and then at the Ecole Pratique des Études until September this year, she's still there, but she's also here as the new uh, president of the Oxford Centre for Hebrew and Jewish Studies and director of the Centre of Hebrew and Jewish Studies in Oriental Studies, this faculty, and it's a delight to hand over to Chris Mikoski to ask her about her research. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Martin, and well, first of all, welcome. Uh, it's very, very wonderful to have you here. I can't, I can't think of anyone recently who's left one of the Grand Ecole in Paris to come to Oxford. We're quite, <laughs> we're quite honored and flattered that you've done this, I've, and we hope you won't regret it, but you've been here before, so probably not. Uh, so I think I'll just let you make a few comments to begin with, and then we can talk about some of these interesting materials you brought with you. Thank you very much. Um, First, I would like to tell you a few words about what I do, and I hope not to, not to speak for more than five minutes, so that we can have a very different format, a real conversation, the questions and, uh, and answers. I work on medieval Hebrew manuscripts from, from the East and from the West. Uh, I pick up different subjects, such as Kairogeniza manuscripts, legal documents or books, but also manuscripts and documents from, let's say, 12th and 13th century England. I'm interested in the context in which the manuscripts are produced, in their physical material characteristics, codicology, but especially in the development of the Hebrew script. What I am particularly interested in as a paleographer, I'm a paleographer of uh, Hebrew, is the balance between the transmission of the traditional Hebrew script and the innovation. Because, of course, we are talking about the script that developed in antiquity and is used until today. In the medieval period, I'm working mostly on the manuscripts from the 10th to the 13th century. And one of the aims of my paleographical research is the typology of the Hebrew script and the possibility of dating and localizing the manuscripts according to the script, the most banal role of Hebrew paleography. However, I belong probably to a relatively new school of paleography that we like to call meaningful and transversal paleography, the paleography which does not study the script from only the technical point of view, the technical point of view, the dating, the typology is extremely important, but only when it is placed in a large cultural context. And at the same time, we try to be transversal, which means working with different disciplines, with different paleographies or book histories, mm -hmm. different cultures, from several, uh, for several reasons. First of all, the Jewish people, by definition, live among the others. So they, it's very difficult to talk about Hebrew manuscripts as a phenomenon which is completely separated from what is happening around the Jewish community. So although the Hebrew language and the Hebrew script are used as a kind of koine script and language from one Jewish community to another, across the centuries there is always another language and very frequently another literacy which concerns the Jewish people. So it is meaningful because we study the culture as such and not only the script and its development, and also its transversal, because, as has been already pointed out by my masters and predecessors, Professor Colette Sirat and Malachi Betarier, every single Hebrew manuscript or written document is a transcultural artifact, mm -hmm. which, is, which links the Jewish people, Jewish culture, Jewish book production 
with its non-Jewish context. And at the same time, the development of the Hebrew book traditions, but also of the Hebrew script, bears the traces of the contacts with these other more general cultures. So we could talk about this mutual influence from many points of view, and I have made a handout hoping that that's what we are going to talk about today. <laughs> so in this handout, I tried in, in images, because we talk about paleography, so about something which is extremely graphic and visual. So I have chosen to show you a few images just to explain how much the Hebrew general, uh, general aesthetics of the book and also the Hebrew script changes according to the context. So you have in number two different uh, representations of the book, different page layouts. The two first manuscripts come from the Western Latinity, whereas the, the third manuscript come from, from Spain and is very similar both as far as the page layout is concerned, but also as far as the shapes of the Hebrew letters are concerned to the Arabic script. I tried as well to explain why does it happen? Why Jewish manuscripts change and are influenced from the envi envi environing culture? Well, it's quite simple. Of course, we talk about the contacts between the Jewish people and the others. If the Jewish book, books look, look like the books of the other people, that means that the Jewish people know how to read them, or at least handle these books, in order to be influenced, in order to, so that these, these cultural objects have an impact, aesthetical impact, on their own culture. That's exactly how the, the subject has been approached until now by Colette Sirat, Malachi Betarier, and other Hebrew book historians. However, I personally find it insufficient. It's not enough just to handle a book, to begin to produce the books in the same way. Well, maybe some material features such as parchment, elaboration of, of the book, the form of the book, is easier to accept talking about cultural models. However, the development of the script, I think, is much more profound than just looking at Arabic script or even reading the Arabic script or looking at the Latin script and what trying to imitate the forms, this is much more complicated. So I try to approach the question from a different point of view, from the point of view of cognitive sciences and Jewish education. First of all, I went to the medieval corpora of manuscripts, such as the wonderful Cairo Geniza, and found out that indeed the education of children from the very early stages is bilingual, of course, because the Jews in, in medieval Egypt spoke Arabic as they, as they mother, mother tongue, but also the education was bi-alphabetical, and you have a very good example in number three of your handout, where a child learns Hebrew and Arabic alphabet at the same time, and I found his Arabic much better than his Hebrew. <laughs> and I think that it's quite important, because what I claim is that in order for the Hebrew script to develop, to resemble Latin script on one side of the world or Arabic script on the other side of the world, the writers of this script must really master the form of the, of the other script, mm -hmm. must be really completely at ease with that. So my other question, and of course I, we have no time, but in support, of this, um, of this uh, uh, bi, bi alphabetical learning and education, there are several documents from the Cairo Geniza, published mainly by Shlomo of Goitain, that explain that children were going to, a, to an Arabic school and to a Hebrew school at the same time. So, or one after another, they couldn't learn at the same time, but let's say uh, in the same context. So, we know as well from the text that children learned how to write in Arabic, not only speak, but write in Arabic script. So I asked myself as well about the spread of the Arabic literacy among medieval Jews. I don't have time to go into it, but I have given you a few, um, a, a few examples again, showing at the bottom of the page of number four, an autograph of Maimonides, which is written in, of the guide of the perplex, which is in Arabic language but in Hebrew script, and all the autographs of Maimonides, 
In the Cairo Geniza, we have several dozens of those, of different texts, including medical texts which were destined for Arabic leaders are in Hebrew script. However, they were immediately transmitted in Arabic script. So we know that some scholars such as Maimonides would prefer to write in Hebrew, but of course, he was the, the physician of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the caliph's family. So he spoke Arabic, he, 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 he used Arabic, he read Arabic, and he wrote Arabic without any doubt. However, at least for some of his texts, he tried to control the transmission of these texts in Hebrew characters. We have as well two examples uh, at the top. One is the same guide, but from the 13th century, written in Arabic characters. However, the Bi Bible quotations are in Hebrew characters. You can't make immediately a difference between the two scripts because the scribe writes very fluently in both and they look very much alike. And you have as well the first on your right. It's a Hebrew Bible in Arabic characters written by a Karite scribe. So you can have not only Judea Arabic, but you can have as well the Arabo Judaic. Uh, and this is the work of Jeffrey Kahn. I have given you as well, in number five, some examples of Christian writing in Hebrew. The Hebrew, especially in the manuscript Leiden at the bottom of the page, as you can see, we have here a trilingual Psalter in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew characters. The Hebrew is absolutely beautiful, very calligraphic. There is no doubt about it. The scribe is an artist. However, even if he's an artist, looking at his script as a Hebrew paleographer, I can immediately say that his ductus, that means the way he shapes the letters, the direction of the strokes, the way the strokes communicate and the number of strokes, uh, is not that of someone who learned how to write in his, well, I would say her, but there were so few women scribes that I would rather <laughs> keep to his infancy or childhood. So uh, I, from that, I deduce that when you write, just when, when you speak, you can have an accent. When you are a bi-alphabetical scribe and you learn how to write a different, you acquire a different graphic system later in your life, your accent from the first graphic system you learned as a child remains. <coughs> try to learn Hebrew today, like I did at the age of, let's say, 17, well, everybody sees that I'm not an Israeli from my handwriting. It's not the same, although I try my best. Of course, you can have calligraphers who can imitate the writing of other people. You can, as well, forgers who do it very well. Still, a good paleographer should be able to recognize the hands. And then at the end, to finish, I would like to tell you that I have decided to use this concept of the accent in writing in order to understand the development of the Hebrew script. I don't like to talk about evolution because Hebrew script does not develop in itself. It's the scribes that change it. And I have, I have used here to illustrate it a very easy example, which is a mercantesca, a merchant's professional group script that developed around the year 1000 in North Africa, Kairouan. These are the so-called Al-Maghrebi uh, merchants who developed a script which really looks like Arabic. And I have given you a few elements. It's a very cursive, rapid script. Of course, the scribes are, um, are merchants. They are in a hurry. They communicate across a large network of it is a professional network, so they not only read easily this kind of script because they are trained to do it, but also <coughs> they recognize immediately the letter that arrives as the letter written by a fellow Maghribi scribe. So what I have realized is that not only this script is a cursive that I don't go into the details to define what it is, but especially some of the forms are traced from the point of view of the movement of the hand, just like the Arabic letters. These are not the same letters. I have given you some examples. For, in, for instance, the Hebrew letter He at the end of the word, when the preceding letter stops at the baseline, is a loop which looks like an Arabic wow. It's not the same letter, but the frequency of using this particular letter at the end of the word is very similar across Hebrew and Arabic. So it's not phonetic. <laughs> it's not the question of uh, 
trying to render the same letter but the same shape. No, but it's a question of rendering the same movement, making the same movement with the same frequency. And similarly, you have, you have similarities between, uh, between the Hebrew Aleph and Arabic Ein. It's not the same letter, but it appears in similar graphic environment. So the scribe is using the same movement of the hand and so on and so forth. I could multiply the examples, but I understand that, uh, I, I hope that you understand my point. And in order to explain what is happening with this scribe, I went to the theories of um, cognitive psychologists working on script and handwriting in southern France in the CNRS today, and I, I, I was in touch and also um, read with pleasure the works of Jean-Luc Vellet uh, and uh, Marie-Ecke Loncon, who claim that when you acquire writing and reading skills that usually go together, your brain learns in a way to write in such a way that your sensory motor movements work with the memory which is ingrained in your cortex. Okay, I don't go into, into detail, detail again here. In such a way that when you write a letter, when you close your eyes and you trace your I or your A or your I or your E, you can still do it even if you don't look at it. That means that the sensory motor memory works like a connection between the brain and the hand without necessarily needing to pass by the visual aspect. Okay? This is how we learn to write. And then another psychological concept, when you write, you can write in a very controlled way. You write and you think about how you write, especially when you fake or when you, when you learn how to write, when you are young. But when you are a very um, experienced writer or scribe, and especially when you write something informal, you focus on what you want to write, on the contents, contents of your text, and what happens with the writing itself. Your hand is apparently on an automatic pilot, which and then your consciousness switches, it switches itself on every four seconds. But most of your writing, it's quasi-automatic. And I have no time, I will stop here, but I claim that the evolution of the script depends very much on what you have learned as far as the sensory motor capacities are concerned. This is the memory of the gesture which is ingrained in your brain, like when you forget your, your, your bank card number, okay? You try to remember it, you will never. But when you go to the bank, you close your eyes and you try to type it, it will, it will come back. That's your hand, that's your hand that remembers and not your brain, okay? It's an automatic pilot. And I claim that because you learned in your childhood a certain way of tracing letters, this is what happens when you write in the first graphic, graphic system, but also in the second. And this explains the change of the Hebrew script through time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> well, that's uh, very interesting. And uh, we have a lot of different kinds of expertises, obviously, that you have to have to do what you're doing. So I want to, I want to talk with you a little bit about that, but I suppose um, because your work is so dependent on material things that I want to talk to you a little bit about the research universe you inhabit where you're able to look at those things. So could I ask you, first of all, uh, the poster that was put up, there was, um, there was an image, I suppose you selected this image. Uh, I suppose you all saw this image, it was uh, on this page. So why don't I start, wha what is this exactly and uh, why did you pick that one? Well, if I hoped you, <laughs> you will ask me <laughs> about this image. One of the, it, it is not really related to what I have just been saying because the image went uh, to print before, before I thought about what we could do today. However, this is one of the research projects I have been working on. This is a project about the specific shape of the Hebrew book, which is a rotulus. Mm -hmm. As you can see, this is just a fragment, the beginning and the end is missing. It is the Rotulus, it's a scroll, but unlike the usual Torah scroll or volumen or Megillah, it does not 
unfold horizontally but vertically mm -hmm. in such a way that it's a narrow, narrow, uh, long uh, st strip of, of a book. Mm -hmm. And until now, this kind of rotuli were associated with, uh, with the very ancient period, either antiquity, because they are mentioned in, in uh, classical Jewish literature, uh, in the Talmud, but um, uh, when found in the Middle Ages, they were considered to be very ancient prior to the 10th century and so on and so forth. Mm, but going through the Geniza, um, Geniza collections with the, with the aim of looking at the book formats in particular, um, I, I myself and, and, uh, and Professor Gidon Bohak, we are working on this subject together from Tel Aviv University, we were able to identify more than 450 fragments of Jewish books on Rotuli, and some of them from the 13th century. So simply instead of talking about Jewish books as the form of the codex, well, scroll, first of all, the ancient Jewish book and codex, we can add a third form that was in use in, in, the, in the Oriental communities, which is the, vertic uh, the vertical um, scroll, which is Rotulus. This particular one was, I like it. I put it here because I simply like it very much. Uh, it, is, um, it is a late Midrashic text. Um, and uh, I was able to identify the scribe. It's very difficult to link in the Cairo Geniza the literary texts and the documents, documentary texts, but I was able to do it. So I was able to identify the scribe of, 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 this, um, of this book with a scribe of some documents and put him firmly in the small town of Damira in the 13th century. And what is very funny is that on the verso that you can see on the, on the, on the image, there is a formula of protecting the book from worms. This is a magical formula. <laughs> <laughs> the book, you worm, go away. And it's an Arabic formula in Arabic script, which is very important. And like this, I have started to be interested in the methods of medieval conservation. Mm -hmm. How you conserve the books <laughs> through magical <laughs> formula, worm, go away. Now we ha there, are su there are such verses written on uh, Sanskrit manuscripts as yes. well. Oh, they're I would be very they're interested. They're mostly, about, uh, they're mostly instructions to the owner of the book. Um, I, and they talk about uh, this was created at pains to my um, hips and back and uh, <laughs> hand, and uh, so don't damage it, please. And oh, that's <laughs> good, yes. <laughs> we like have that. in the Hebrew <laughs> manuscripts, we have as well, as well formula which talk, talk about theft and protecting and not selling and so on and so forth. But this one is really a formula of paper conservation that I find absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> It is indeed. So I think uh, so. Some of you here do uh, Hebrew Jewish studies, and uh, will know what the Cairo Geniza is. But uh, it probably would be useful for you to tell us a little bit about that. It comes up in some other fields: the history of exact sciences, the history of astrology. We all know, mm -hmm. but uh, I suppose not, maybe not everyone knows what the Cairo Geniza is. So could you talk a little bit about? What is it? Where are the materials now? And um, how unique is that collection? Right. Um, first of all, when you have a community of compulsive book readers and producers, you have lots of books and documents, and you have to do something with them. You can reuse them. You can throw them away. You can destroy them. You can burn them, all kinds of things. Well, you can't. According to the Jewish tradition, you cannot destroy the books because they might contain the name of God or combinations of letters of the Hebrew alphabet that contain the name of God. So there are other ways of disposing of too many books and papers that you have, that you have at home. You can't accumulate the, the books or papers. So you put them in a geniza, which is a specific place or a chamber, or it can be a, as well a specific tomb in the cemetery where the books are protected from profanation by human agent, but where they can decay, they are not protecting, protected from decay. They decay, but peacefully, by natural <laughs> means. <laughs> this is what a geniza is. Uh, there were genizot in most Jewish medieval communities. We have sources about it, and there are genizot until today. So this is something that, that started at least in the Talmudic period, because it's mentioned in the classical Jewish texts, and then it continues until today. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, most of these genizot have disappeared. 
or have not yet been discovered. <laughs> Let's be positive about it. <laughs> we discover Genizot, but modern. In Europe, in North Africa, there are new discoveries of manuscripts, even in archaeological excavations, but they don't go back to the Middle Ages. Uh, such a Geniza existed in the synagogue of Ben Ezra, which was a medieval synagogue of the, of the Jews of Eretz Israel, or Palestinian <coughs> ritual. Mm, this Geniza was known to scholars throughout the 19th century. In the 19th century, some manuscripts were taken out of this chamber and uh, in the synagogue and sold in the antiquarian market. And then at the end, there was a huge race of two universities to get the manuscripts from the Geniza, Oxford with Adolf Neubauer and Cambridge with Solomon Schechter. Cambridge won. <laughs> <laughs> and the large part of the manuscripts is today preserved in the Cambridge University Library, over 180,000 fragments uh, that were brought, fortunately looted by Solomon Schechter from <laughs> the Geniza but uh, brought to, to, to Cambridge and preserved. Fortunately, s several thousands of manuscripts were acquired as well by Neubauer for the Bodleian Library, and Bodleian Library is one of the most precious collections of Geniza fragments because Neubauer picked up very important manuscripts. Uh, there are today manuscripts from the Cairo Geniza in 72 collections in the world, so they are scattered around, and there are more than 300,000 fragments of manuscripts. We, until today, we don't know to how many original books and documents they belong. There are several projects. The most important of them is Friedberg Geniza project, which puts online the digital images of all the manuscripts from the Geniza, but also works on automatic recognition of manuscripts, so that at the end we could put together different pieces of the same manuscripts. It doesn't work very well yet, but there is progress being done. Uh, this is a, a project run by the uh, computer scientists from, uh, from Tel Aviv, and indeed every year progresses are made uh, in I automatic identification of the manuscripts. Well, I'm afraid I have many more questions. We're mm -hmm. just about to run out of time, but let me ask you a uh, something like a comparative question, which is simply that we seem to be in a period where uh, script and writing cultures um, and sort of the processes of writing I is becoming sort of a thing in the world of research. Now, I can't accuse you of being trendy because you've been doing this for quite some time, but uh, there is a big grant that was uh, one of these excellence grants in Germany at the Hamburg mm -hmm. University. We just all got the email about it. Yeah, and that's only one of a number of examples. So do you, uh, what do you suppose is, is causing, is, does this have anything to do with the fact that people no longer write things and uh, mm. instead, use <laughs> <laughs> uh, instead use smartphones and yes. stuff like that? Yeah, it's an excellent <laughs> question. You know, I myself come from a long tradition of Hebrew paleography because I studied with Colette Sirat and Malachi Betarie and they were there in the 50s. Yes. So actually we, are, we have been the first surprised that paleography <laughs> suddenly became so important. I think that, yes, that the fact that the manuscripts are available today, it's quite paradoxical because somehow when you have all these manuscripts online, why should you be interested in the materiality? But I think that looking at the images, looking at the manuscripts, people are more and more aware that it's very difficult to work on textuality without taking into consideration the material envelope. And although for me and my own training, that's something that I have known since I was a student, because that, that it's my training, I understand that this is a very big new trend and I'm very happy about it. And I think that indeed uh, new approaches will, uh, will be developed. And indeed, we are all envious to what is happening in Hamburg. <laughs> 55 <laughs> postdoctoral yeah. scholarships. Well, congratulations to our colleagues in Hamburg because it's absolutely wonderful. Mm. And also across disciplines because they yes, work indeed. on different mm. book histories, paleographies and writing mm. uh, cultures at the same time under the same roof. So mm. that's absolutely wonderful. Right, and all, all sorts of comparative possibilities there, which we didn't get into, but thank you very much. I think, I think we do have to stop, but thank you for that. Thank uh, you. Thanks a lot.